live from PNP Studios. This is the Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework Biweekly Sync. Today is December 30th. I am your host, David Warner with Catapult and a PNP team member, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. We've got a packed agenda with the latest updates on the SharePoint framework. We're going to find out about some patterns and practices updates around PNPJS, CLI for Microsoft 365, reusable PNP SPFX controls, and we're going to discuss the new community samples, and we're going to all fit into the picture time together, I think, maybe. <laughs> then we're going to see our awesome rock stars of the day, our demos from Ejaz Hussein from Content to Cloud on uh, adaptive card extensions for planner tasks. We're going to dive into some SPFX design patterns around property controls with Hugo Bernier, and then we're going to dive back into Viva Connections ACES with card view types in SharePoint Framework with Paolo Pialorsi. Now let's talk about some opportunities to participate in our community here. You can provide an SPFX demo on this call. It's a great opportunity for you to showcase some examples, some of the work you've done and share with others all of the things that you've been able to do within the Microsoft 365 tenancy. In fact, we invite you to fill out the demo spot. It makes it a little easier for you. You can use that URL right there on the screen uh, or that you see in your chat and we'll get back to you. And in fact, if you're a little nervous about uh, providing a demo, maybe it's your first time, we could even assist you by providing you a buddy uh, that would demo along with you. That's part of the Sharing is Caring initiative. So feel free to reach out to Hugo Bernier or myself, David Warner, and we can assist you with getting set up on a, a buddy if you'd like to demo. You can provide a, a PNP demo right, on any other areas of the Patterns and Practices community using those particular resources. You can contribute on GitHub. We have lots of reports, uh, reporting issues, and you can submit pull requests. And then, of course, you can provide feedback. So we always look to, to know if there's improvements that you would like, uh, some ways in which you could add and accentuate the community in these calls, and positive feedback and constructive feedback is good as well. So we always like to hear uh, what you feel is working and what you feel could be improved as well. Now, there are a plethora of resources available. Uh, the videos, there are community videos and developer videos that are available to you. There's a number of open source community uh, opportunities here around uh, Office Dev, Microsoft Graph, Patterns of Practices. These include things like the CLI, uh, PNPJS, a number of resources and tools that you can not only utilize, but that you can contribute back to as well. And of course, we have our sample galleries and all of these sample galleries include uh, samples that were not created by Microsoft, but were actually created by members of the community, such as yourself. And so we'd like to see you contribute to these as well. Uh, if you need assistance, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can get access to all of these components at aka.ms forward slash M365 PNP. Uh, that is your one stop shop to everything related to the Microsoft 365 community. And we invite you to join uh, that site. Go check it out, see all the links and see what can uh, provide you the most benefits to take advantage of your experience in Microsoft 365. Now, we also have the platform calls. Now, these are occurring every Tuesday. Uh, they've been started since August. And uh, the platform means that this is going to be demonstrations by Microsoft employees, so coming straight from the mothership. These are every Tuesday. You can get to them at the aka.ms forward slash m365-dev-call URL. That'll provide you the invite that you can add to your calendar. Extremely valuable. Next Tuesday, January 4th, we're gonna have a demo from Michael, Sebastian, and Vesa. And again, these are all demos provided by employees at Microsoft uh, and is always gonna provide you the coolest, latest and greatest that's going on within the organization. So definitely add that to your calendar. It is invaluable. Now we talked about a number of initiatives that are available to you as part of the community. It may be a little intimidating though, because there's so many and some of them might be complex. You may feel like, well, it's not my place to contribute. Uh, it absolutely is. And in fact, we would like to see you. And in fact, we would like to help you contribute. So the Sharing is Caring initiative and program is here to provide you hands-on guidance. We're actually gonna walk you through how to do things like prepare for your first demo. Uh, perhaps as I mentioned, you wanna have a buddy as part of your first demo. Uh, maybe you've not interfaced with GitHub yet, but you've created a really cool sample that you'd like to contribute to one of the sample galleries. Our first-time contributor and our Power Platform samples first-time contributor sessions will walk you through making your first ever contribution. And even if you've made contributions to GitHub before, but maybe it's a little rusty, we can help you there too. These are all safe space opportunities. They're not recorded and they're absolutely available to you throughout the months of the year. We always schedule them often. 
So go to aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring to register. And of course, we have our upcoming ACEs, uh, connect, Viva Connections ACEs session that's going to uh, span a couple of different days so that we can really dive deep on that to assist you. And then, of course, all of the Ask Me Anythings. Very, very popular. Uh, we're going to have some open discussions like we have for the Tuesday calls, and we're going to start with PNP Search in January. So definitely go join those. Again, safe space, all completely free, no cost at all. Now, once you have contributed, we want to celebrate all of the work you're doing. Uh, you're doing amazing work by providing contributions to the community, and those contributions come in many forms. They could be providing a demo on this call. Uh, they could be contributing to one of the samples. Uh, they could be writing a blog. And, and when you do that, we want to formally and officially celebrate that. Our PNP recognition program is one that is set up with Credly. We partnered with Credly. Yes, that's the same Credly that handles all of the certification badges that you get when you're a Microsoft certified. So we are creating official badges that are going to sit right alongside those that you can put on your LinkedIn profile, you can put on your website, you can share on Twitter, uh, and it is no cost to you. Uh, we're having a number of initiatives that we kicked off to test this in 2021. We're going to have even more in 2022, but we do need you to opt in. No cost to you, as I mentioned, we cover the cost, aka.ms forward slash m365pnp dash recognition, and you only have to opt in once, uh, even though we're going to be creating new uh, badges throughout the years, we absolutely will be able to continue to connect your profile uh, to your GitHub and account to make sure that you continue to get celebrated and recognized throughout the years. Next, let's hand it over to Vesa to talk a little bit more about the SharePoint framework from engineering. Thank you, David, on that one. Uh, so we did update uh, the chart again this week, uh, and uh, December 13th is currently the all-time highest uh, usage of SPFX uh, in the world, which is pretty cool. So the usage is growing still rapidly uh, across the Microsoft 365. And of course, right now we are in the holiday season, which we can see from the attendance of this call and also on the usage uh, from this week, which is significantly lower, but it's aligned across the year ago. Actually, if I have a look on the Tuesday usage, this week and the Tuesday usage uh, on January, oh, sorry, December 2020, uh, we're significantly higher. So anyway, so following slide is quickly the roadmap updates. So not really significant updates in here. 1.14 is the 1.14 preview is the latest. We're looking into getting 1.14 updated beta available in early January. So hopefully next week or week after, and then uh, by end of the January, we'll get the 1.14 out and that's the objective. In 1.14, we focus on new templates. There's the ACE uh, adaptive card caching and a few other capabilities. And then during springtime, a uh, lot of efforts on over, uh, supporting the overriding of new and edit panels with SPFX in list and libraries. And then uh, teams, 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 teams as a, and of course, we have a connection as a focus area. So, but not a significant amount of updates as such in here, but a lot of stuff in the pipeline as well. Let's move on. Thank okay. you, Vesa. Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's move into PNP client side libraries, otherwise known as PNPJS. Uh, version 2.12 is a little delayed given the holidays. We understand that, no doubt. Uh, but version 3 is uh, coming soon. There's all kinds of documentation going on. Um, all tests are passing, which is fantastic. Uh, there's a discussion going on. It's a pinned discussion. So if you go into PNPJS in the GitHub, look for discussion 1979. It is pinned, so it's right there at the top, and you can absolutely contribute. Uh, we invite anyone and everyone to again be part of that upgrade you can assist in all of the um the testing and documentation if you'd like so definitely help out there uh, and you can be part of that let's move into cli for microsoft 365 uh, there's a new beta version 4.3 it's got upgrading spfx projects from uh, to the beta of spfx 1.14 uh, retrieving information about aad app registrations adding external connections for microsoft search and retrieving installed web languages and so much more uh, you can always install the beta by using the at next uh, suffix as part of your installation on the npm uh, controls so definitely take advantage of that and you can help uh, test out that uh, that beta Next up is the SPFX reusable components. Uh, React controls version 3.5.0 has SPFX 1.13 uh, star support. 
enhancements for multiple controls, updated localization for German, Norwegian, and Portuguese, and along with a bunch of other various fixes. And then the property controls, which are the ones that you see in your property pane, uh, version 3.3.0 also has SPFX 1.3. star support with multiple enhancements for the property field collection data. So definitely take advantage of that. You can see all the release notes there, uh, and we have the URLs that are available for you to take advantage of. So you can go to aka.ms forward slash SPFX controls react, uh, or you can go to SPFX property controls and you can take advantage of uh, using all of these resources that are very, very cool. Don't reinvent the wheel, take advantage of them. Next up is PNP modern search. Uh, we've got the December release version 4.5.2. Uh, you can check out all the details there. A huge shout out to a number of our contributors, uh, and you can see the release notes uh, there as well. And again, we've got a PNP search sharing is caring AMA coming up in January. So if you're a big PNP search fan, which we all should be, makes the search experience so much better, then definitely take advantage of these resources and utilization tools. And next up is uh, PNP SPFX samples. For that, we'll hand the mic over to Hugo. Thank you, David. So we have a whole bunch of samples in uh, multiple repositories, but the two repositories I want to talk to you about today is the SPFX web part and the SPFX extension samples, which are curated samples. They're provided by the community, but they're curated. We make sure that they are good samples, that they demonstrate a good concept or that they demonstrate a full solution, that you know the code is actually uh, you know doing using good patterns and uh, that the code is safe. Uh, we welcome contributions from everyone, but we also encourage you to go take a look and learn from these samples. So these are the samples over the last two weeks. We have a new SPFX extension. It's a new field customizer that when you use multiple lines on a, on a field and you have uh, append changes to existing text, it kind of creates a little memo type of field, uh, but in the list uh, rendering, it usually renders a hyperlink that says view all entries. Well, King uh, Kazala has actually created a field customizer that aggregates all the entries and displays them with a date and the author information. And if the field has no value, it remains empty. So it's actually a really good uh, sample. On the web part site, we have a, an update to uh, my teams, which was upgraded to SPFX 113.1 by Eve Abersat. Uh, Mohamed Amer updated the calendar web part to SPFX 112.1. The new web part by Marcus Muller, uh, which is the taxonomy file explorer. So if you ever wanted to have uh, documents appear in multiple folders, and you wanted to associate those folders to a term set tree, this is the web part for you. It allows you to actually create a, a file explorer and allows you to drag and drop documents against various term sets. And then these documents will actually appear in multiple folder like things. And then we have an updated to, uh, advanced page property web part by Abderman Mujahid, where we've updated some in court lists like site assets and site pages. That's all for me. And then we have more samples on the adaptive card extension. And for that, I'll give it back to David. All right. And yes, as mentioned, we do have a newer SPFX adaptive card extensions repository. Uh, now this is available for contributions. We know again, this is a newer area of the SPFX family. And so we invite your contributions. If you have any questions, reach out to Hugo or myself or Derek Cash Peterson. Uh, and again, we're going to be coming up with a sharing is caring session on how you can get more involved with Viva Connections adaptive card extensions. Uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be a two part series. And, and the newest is a COVID indicator from Zhao Mendez. Uh, so Again, we're open for more contributions. Definitely reach out if you'd like to get more involved. Now it's time for optional picture time. So we'll hand it over to Tavessa and he will, everyone can share their cameras. We'll capture us all smiling and I will. Here we go. So we only have now 25 seats um, today because we are at the it's holiday season. So we are, we are maxed out at uh, apparently in roughly 60. Let's see if we can fill in 25. So we get some variance on the on the new seat. I can say, Seb, don't step, don't touch me. Don't. <laughs> 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 Sorry. I guess a few more seats, few more seats, few more seats. Uh, who's 
looks like I'm, I guess we need to start recording. Uh, let me one more second, one more second. I didn't class the three, two, one, and let's do some hand waving. Hello, right. hello style uh, this time. Thanks everybody. Really awesome to have you on the call as well. Thank you. And Seb is doing his typical <laughs> to get a more dance. Thank you. <laughs> we need a little a little bobble Seb for all our dashboards in our cars. It reminds me of the bobble Seb. All right, let's get back to our slides. That's... That is, by the way, a great GIF animation, which is on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Seb, that's it. That is going to haunt you for years. So, <laughs> but I guess it's good. So, <laughs> the example that we all strive for. All right. Maybe we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. Love it. <laughs> all right. Let's jump into our demos. Our first is Ejaz Hussein on uh, planner tasks inside of Viva Connections Adaptive Cards extension. Ejaz? Let me share my screen. Perfect. Take it away. Right, so today I'm presenting a, a adaptive card extension uh, about the planner tasks. So my name is Ejaz. I work for a company called Content and Cloud, and here's my Twitter friend, uh, uh, my personal blog URL. Uh, so the, the main idea basically is to uh, about this uh, demo is to show all the planner tasks from all user associated planner plans. So for example, you, you could be part of different plans or on the Planner plan, so it could be a different you're part of working on a different teams groups, and you you know you're part of different planner plans. So you wanna have some consolidated view of all your plans in in one place, and this is where it's basically this idea came from. So and also ability to uh, view your task, a single task, specific task, and see. Uh, uh, whether is it like when is started, when is ending, and some you know description or etc. Some some other fields if you want to do display there, uh, and then ability to filter task as well based on the selected plans. And so this is where so you have a list of let's suppose you're part of ten plans, and then you use, you can see all of them, but you can also filter based on where you want which which plan you wanted to bring task from. So. And then, uh, so what I'm kind of highlights of this demo is I'm using primary text template. Uh, I'm using Microsoft Graph to get all my planner tasks. Uh, I'm using async dropdown property pane uh, to display all my uh, uh, plans, which I'm associated. Uh, and I'll show you in a second uh, in a demo. And then uh, based on which our uh, plan or, and the task you click on, you go into detail and then you, uh, also ability to navigate into the planner of that specific task as well. And so here is a repo where is this uh, the sample code is available. So if you go back to the demo, um, so so this is where is I'm in the preview mode in the mobile view. So here you could see is giving I'm basically displaying again showing all of my uh, uh, tasks from all plans. At the moment, that's where you can see all here. Uh, and at the moment, I have a one upcoming task and six overdue tasks. Because we have like a limitation, we only have like two rows to display here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, might be some other uh, way to do add some more data here, but I was able to get only two rows to fill in. So that's why I was like upcoming only and overdue task. So if I click on, uh, on, on the actual card, it will give me some summary of uh, different types of tasks like upcoming, overdue task, in progress, uh, and pending and completed tasks. So here, from you can basically navigate to individual uh, types of tasks. Let's suppose you want to see, and you can see this this turning into red color when is overdue. So this is also part of adaptive card. Uh, so if you click on the view of the overdue tasks, and uh, what I'm bringing here is a name of the task. Uh, which plan this is belong to, what's the status uh, uh, on that task and the due date. And if the due date is passed, uh, then it will turn into red and then some description. And then uh, and then another is you, you have a list of tasks basically. So this is a single adaptive card where I'm, I'm basically looping through all the due tasks in here. And then if you click on the view planner here, it will open up this particular task right in the planner, and then you can have further details there as well. Now, so that's the, so you can go back 
for clicking here. You can, you know, vice versa. You can see your other task here as well, etc. And you navigate to, uh, uh, you know, you navigate into your planner as well directly from here. Now, if I go uh, to the desktop mode and I'll close the preview. Now, if I go and select this and click on go to the properties, if you can see here at the moment, it's all is bringing tasks from all of them. But this is where I'm. This is the select planner planner plan. You can select specific plan here. So uh, might be the company tools is the one you wanted to bring tasks from. So you can see is automatically replace the company tools and also only show you the task. Uh, which we wanted to show them. So if I and also vice versa, so if you go to the you know the next one, so you can see this, you you basically able to see only the tasks which are from the company tools. So that's also replicated here as well. So that that and you you can you can go into the further detail into uh, the each of them. So yeah, that was the demo. And now if we go back to the code, uh, and how did I manage to do that? Um, so if I start from here uh, to my the main uh, the plan task adaptive card extension .ts file, uh, that's the main file when we started. And the first of all is I'm uh, I'm basically uh, initializing which uh, main card I'm going to use. So I've got planet main card view. So uh, I mean this is like a more of a using those card where there's a main card view or where there's a quick view. So I'm using those as a naming convention so that is easy to uh, use and navigate to in the code. So I'm using two quick views and one card view here. So in initialization on init function, I'm calling my all the uh, by default is getting all plans, uh, which is my uh, graph service. So I'm getting all the plans uh, when, when it's first load. And then I have a, a property pane which I'm using a cust uh, a property pane async dropdown. So this is where basically I'm fetching. So based on you change your uh, selected plan, you go and get it's going to go and get the plans for you and uh, display you in there. So right at this point, this is what we we get. And then what we do is uh, and the default one is we are using uh, the primary one. Um, Render card is a main card view. So if I go to the main card view one um, here, so here we have if the due task is less than zero, uh, for some reason something goes wrong, it will show you this task. It says it's still loading planet tasks, etc. Some images with SVG. Uh, but if it's not, if we have some task from the uh, loaded from the graph, then you will see some upcoming and overdue tasks. And vice versa. So this is the two options you saw uh, early on uh, when the page loaded. So now, now when we click on them, because we have a button here. So when we click on them, what I'm doing is I'm pl calling planet tasks types quick view. So where is going to show us the types of. So the, the reason why I was mentioning about the naming convention. So easy for me now here is to looking at this. I can easily go to the task types view here. So and I can go to the class actual and here I'm building um, uh, the types I have. So this could be some dynamic, but at the moment uh, for the sake of demo, I've just added like a five or six types of uh, a task I wanted to see and use the different icons based on the type of task they are. Now, it, the, if you see the task, I'm based on the, I'm getting the count. So I already have a task because when we, uh, the good thing with this is we, because once we have once loaded the data, is state is available across all of these classes. So I'm using the same task which has been populated initially on first load. So here I'm basically filtering based on uh, the number of count based on the types uh, we are in. So and on click, so what I'm doing is I'm calling. Uh, so if I open up quickly the JSON uh, adaptive card, so I'm passing this array uh, task types here into data, and I'm basically doing displaying the icon and then uh, the type, the date, uh, the due date, and uh, and and also the action as well. So that if you see here, I'm using text uh, text uh, rich text block here for. Uh, I think there was a, a. I was only able to use this text run to be able to get uh, some colors applied into the color. I think there was a bug initially, so I think they might have been fixed. So, uh, but yeah, I've used this one to apply some coloring uh, based on the logic and based on the count. Uh, but then, 
here is the main thing is where we are passing in the action the id basically the id based on when they click they will be passing this is the id and this guy will come here and this is the id basically we're setting the selected type now when we go to the quick view and this is the state is there is a selected type and now i can go to list quick view which will be this list view and there is the based on the selected state on the previous uh, class i can then filter task based on where uh, you know the, the select is a due overdue in progress etc and then i'm going to display pass this data to the list view my other adaptive card and uh, if you can see here it's basically this is the task i'm passing this data and i'm building this all items uh, underneath in the in the loop basically uh, so I have a column set, uh, uh, two, three, four columns there. So I have a four column set, and because I think for one for uh, title, uh, and this is the title, another one is the, the plan, uh, and then the status and the due date, et cetera, as well. So yeah, so this is the, when you can see here, uh, so this is the types, and then when you go inside, um, let's see in here, and this is where it's building this template from there. Yeah, so off from that, so if you want to go to uh, controls, so you would see uh, there's a lot of uh, this nice documentation on the Microsoft uh, document uh, documents about the property pane async. So I'll follow that. And so it's just a uh, uh, property async drop down code, all the code is here as well, uh, which we I'm calling from my property pane. Um, and here is my graph service, which is really simple, simple one. I'm not using the user profile, but I'm using get plan, planner plans, get planner tasks, get all tasks, get plan info. And this is the get query, which I'm, you know, building the query and passing to this, this guy. And it's basically returning me the data. So yeah, that's, that's all me. Uh, that's all uh, from me. If you guys have any question. Awesome, EJ. It's very, very cool. It's really, really uh, encouraging and to see all the different use cases that the adaptive cards are getting uh, utilized for some creative stuff. So well done there. The link is in the chat for those that would like to check it out. It's also in our ACES repository, so you can always visit there. Thanks again, EJ. Great job. Thank you again for sharing. Okay. Next up is Hugo Bernier on SPFX design patterns. He's got a large bar to, to meet after last week's uh, demo of someone that did a video. So we'll see if you can, you can make it. Uh, so, you know, I, I actually didn't plan to do anything special, uh, but here, there you go. I've added some special uh, holiday. Yes, yeah, that hair you've got grown is very strange looking. <laughs> and... Beautiful, awesome. Okay, so. My name is Hugo Bernier. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. And today I'm going to be talking to you about custom properties part two, because a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago now, we actually started with part one and we kind of ran out of time. But, uh, you know, these presentations are part of a, a series of presentation around SharePoint framework design patterns. This is about how to not only, you know, get started with using some of the technology like SPFX, but also how to best use these things. So what are some of the human interface design user experience principles and things like that, as well as teaching you some tips that you might not know about, even though you may have been uh, using SPFX for a while. So let's get started. When we last met our heroes, we were talking about Property panes, and if you don't remember property panes, is that thing that when you click on configure a web part or an adaptive card extension or a Teams app, it pops up that thing that allows you to configure it. And when we last presented, uh, we talked about all the various property field types, and this is just a, uh, an example of some of the property field types that are available. But if you remember, how we define those property fields. And Ejaz just showed an example of this, but in your web part itself, in the web part.ts, you usually have a method called get property pane configuration. And get property pane configuration returns 
an I property pane configuration interface. So it's a class that, or it's not a class, but it's a structure that needs to have these attributes and it needs to return a bunch of pages, a bunch of headers or a header and a bunch of groups. And inside of each group, you have something called group field. And it's an array. So, you know, we'll open the array with a square bracket and then we'll pass the individual fields that we want to display with a comma. So here I have Boolean field and then we go through all the fields, all the fields that I showed you and we end the array. And that's really what we have to do to actually render some, some property fields and property pane. Now, unfortunately, you know, it would be cool to be able to just uh, drop some actual fields in the code, but we can't. So in the code, what we end up having to do is we have some helpers for each of the first party property pane controls, as well as some of the third party property pane controls. There's usually a helper that, for example, here, if I want to create a new property pane checkbox, I can just call property pane checkbox. Now you may have noticed that EJ has used the new property pane async dropdown. That's actually how normally you would do, you know, anytime you want to create a new component, a new a new object, you would create new something, something. But each one of these controls have a, a helper that will automatically create a new, and it will use the parameters that are passed to actually understand how to create that. So here I have a property pane choice group and so on and so forth. We have my drop down, I have all of them, right? I won't walk you through every single one of them, but those are all very handy helpers that will create those fields for you. Now, how I bind to those properties, you'll notice that for my checkbox, I have a property in my web part that I called from choice. And from choice uh, or from checkbox, from choice, and so on and so forth, right? Now, I probably didn't use the best naming convention for my properties here, but again, it was for the demo purposes. I was trying to show that this is binding to a checkbox or a choice or a dropdown. But where do these properties come from? Well, in your web part, you have the ability to create a, a property interface, our web part property interface, or what we call props. Here, I called mine I, my web part props, and I have an attribute for each one of those uh, values. So for example, I want to show my checkbox. And because we're using TypeScript, well, we want our var values to be strongly typed. So I will specify that this is a Boolean. My choice is going to be a string, and so on and so forth. So now we have used the method to actually render the list of property pane controls. We've defined our properties and we've told SharePoint basically how to store this. Now, what if I wanted to set up some default values, right? Some pre-configured values. Well, in your web part manifest, so see here at the top, I say my web part dot manifest dot JSON. On my, my manifest, I actually have pre-configured entries and I have properties. And here, for example, I've actually defined you know, my checkbox, I want it to be true, my choice, I want it to be spring, and so on and so forth. You can absolutely do that. And the great thing about that is every web part can have more than one manifest, and those values can also be localized as well. So we'll we'll talk about that in a, in a different session where we talk about localization. So, but what if I wanted to create default values that are maybe dynamic? Right, so what if I wanted to create the default value is today's date, or I wanted to calculate some values, or maybe I wanted to pick some values, conditional values based on another value that's been selected. Well, you can't really do that in your manifest because the manifest is intended to be static, but you can do it in your web parts on init method. So the on init method, as you can imagine, gets called when the web part gets initialized and it returns a promise. So that, in other words, it basically says, look, I'm not gonna wait for this web part to, to render the on init or to, to return the on init. I'm just gonna create a promise. And then when you're done, just let me know. And that way your web parts are a bit more responsive. You're able to actually, uh, the system's able to go to every web part and say, hey, 
just so you know, we're about to render you. We're about to. So please go initialize yourself and I'll come back later to render you. So when we do that, one of the things that we can do is we can just return a new promise. And in this case, I'll I'll actually return the promise. I'll create an arrow function so that I don't have to create a whole you know name function somewhere else. And then I'll initialize the data. So in this case, I'll just say the date. If the date is undefined, then I want to set the date to today's date. Now, for the purpose of the demo, I pretend that I already had a variable called today's date, which had today's date. Now, you probably want to make sure that you verify that your properties are are undefined or are valid. So, right here, you probably want to make sure that before you overwrite the uh, the setting, that you always make sure that it's undefined. But you could also do this. Let's say a new selection has been made and you want to invalidate another option because it's no longer a possible choice. Or sometimes you have connected values. So for example, if I selected option A, I want option D and E to be available. But if I select option B, I don't want D and E, right? One of the things that people tend to forget about is they tend to forget to uh, override those values and set them to null so that behind the scenes, you might not be making the, the in your code, you might not be making provision for the fact that, you know, oh, D and E are populated, even though the, the user has selected option B, I'm just going to render, you know, as if uh, D and E were selected. So use this this approach to actually kind of invalidate and verify that the, the properties are configured properly. Now you might say, well, why wouldn't I just do this in the rendering code, right? What, why wouldn't I just, when I render the, the, the control, the web part, why don't I just make sure that all the values are, are proper? You should definitely always validate all the inputs that are coming in. But one of the things that we're trying to do here is one of the principles is you should make sure that all the inputs that are coming in from the web part properties, the web part data itself is always valid so that moving forward, we're able to work with that assumption, right? So that way you always know that your code is, is clean and has all the right attributes. All right, so your web part uh, on init method then needs to resolve, just otherwise your web part is gonna be waiting for you to resolve forever. So that's good. So far, we've defined some properties. We've defined some uh, web parts, uh, web part properties, some attributes and default values and fancy default values. But what about an out of the box web part like uh, like this one here, which is uh, what we call a first party web part, right? A web part that was built by Microsoft. Here's the Quick Links web part. Now, the Quick Links web part has a few interesting things to it. The first thing is it's got a title property, but you may notice that the title property is not actually displayed in the property pane. Uh, and that's because we, we've we talked about this before, you want as much directness as possible. So if it's possible for me to directly edit a property in the edit window or in the canvas or whatever you call that, that window there, uh, you should be able to do that. That's why the rich text web part allows you to edit the rich text directly in the page itself, not through the property pane. But what about uh, this thing here where you have a whole bunch of links? Is that a property? Is that content? And is it something that we should be able to search? Well, here's the problem, right? Uh, we probably don't want our users to be like confused. You know, I thought I found a web part that had this word in it or this title in it. How come I can't find it? Well, we have to remember that when people discover content, uh, we tend to discover content in three ways. One is we browse. And browsing is kind of clicking around, going to a page, and finding content through a discovery process. Now, the other way is if I know exactly what keywords I'm looking for, I should be able to search. And searching allows you to use a keyword and find the results you want, usually. But here's the problem. What if that web part's content, which is maybe stored as a property, what if that content is not searchable? So 
I have an example of a web part that I built that is called uh, Office Hours, right? Which allows you to, if you have if you have a department or something like that, you can actually drop the web part on a page and you can specify what hours, uh, business hours, whatever, right? So what if someone's looking for office hours and you've dropped the web part on a page and that's the only thing in the entire SharePoint site that has the words office hours? And your users are like, I could have sworn I saw a web part somewhere. I saw something. They don't know it's a web part, right? I saw something on a page that said office hours and I just can't find it. So that's the problem. And that's one, one of the things that we have to solve. The other thing we have to consider is the third way that we discover content is through subscribing. And subscribing, we're not talking about like the alert me thing. It's more about either the system determining by your previous actions or you by indicating I'm interested in this. You're telling the system that if something happens that's new related to this, I want to know because I'm too busy to actually look for more content. Let me know when there's new content. Show it to me on, you know, my my summary. Show me, show it to me in an adaptive card or something like that. Now let's look at another web part. So this is the Markdown web part, which is another great first party web part. And it allows you to actually create Markdown content using the same principles we've talked about. You can actually go into the web part. You can edit the web part. But what if I had a whole article here or a whole, I don't know, company policy is written as a markdown entry in a page. Again, your users don't know that it's a web part. They just think it's content. So how am I going to make that content searchable, subscribable? And of course, it's going to be browsable because I can click to it and I can find it. Well, in your web part, you have a method called get properties metadata. That method is probably not in your default web part, but you can absolutely add that method. And what it does is it returns an I web part properties metadata. And it gives you the opportunity to return basically a key value pair of for every property that you want to define, you can actually say that this property can be searchable, can be an image, can be a, a, a link or something like that. Here's that works. So for example, here, my title, property, which I didn't show through the property pane, but it's still something that I've exposed through my web part. I probably want people to find my web part through um, through the title. So if I have a web part called office hours, I should be able to find it. And to do that, I'm going to say is searchable plain text equals true. And that basically says that the title attribute when I store it will be searchable and it's going to be plain text. I could also store HTML values in my web part. And you can absolutely do that. You can actually say, is HTML string equals true. If you have an image and your web part stores an image, you can actually say that it's an image source. Now, the cool thing about image sources is we'll know also if you move images around and things like that, it will understand that it will try to update the properties or at least that's a theory. I've never actually tested that. And same thing with URLs. Now, why would you do that? Well, one of the things that I've done in the past is I've created a web part that creates a uh, markdown charts. And one of the things that I do is when I get the markdown, I parse the markdown, I extract only the text so that people can actually, and I make the text a, a searchable plain text or I could convert it as a HTML and make it a HTML string. But the great thing about that is when you do that, now your users are actually, even though you're rendering a chart, something that is visual, and that's usually not searchable, because I have a hidden property that is stored as a plain text or as HTML string, now my users are able to find that chart, no matter where it is placed in my, in my SharePoint environment, because the attributes are indexed. All right, so let's wrap this up. Next, we're going to be talking about extending property pane. So adding new types of controls like uh, we've seen earlier today. We're going to use the property pane controls and we're going to show how to validate properties. These are some of the articles that I've used to describe some of the principles today, but that's it for me.
Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Awesome, Hugo. Thank you so much. These are really fantastic sessions on setting the, the guidance for the design patterns and development patterns. Excellent job. Great feedback in the chat as well. Next up is Paolo Pialorsi on Viva Connection Ace's card view types and SharePoint framework. Paolo, take it away. Yes, thank you, David, uh, and uh, great demo, Hugo, as always. Uh, let's talk about the available options that we have uh, whenever we want to create uh, an adaptive card extension and we want to focus on the card view types. In fact, whenever we create uh, an adaptive card extension, at the very beginning, the very first uh, content that we get uh, uh, created uh, through the scaffolding tool, the Human Generator for SharePoint Framework, uh, is an adaptive card extension with a card view and the default uh, uh, quick view. And uh, talking about the uh, card view, we always see uh, the options to choose between three different flavors of card view. In this short demo, we will figure out what these uh, uh, card view types are and what are the differences between each of them. So first of all, we have three options, the base basic card view, the base primary text card view, and the base image card view, which are the actual base types uh, that we will inherit from uh, when we will create uh, any card view in an adaptive card extension. All of them have a base class, which is called base card view, and which is defined through some generic attributes like the interface defining the properties and the state of the adaptive card extension. And we will dig into these topics in one of the upcoming demos too, as well as an interface defining the basic card parameters for the card view. And depending on the layout of the basic card parameters, we will have the three different flavors of the card view. So the basic, the primary text, and the image one. An important thing to know is that whenever you create an adaptive card extension, uh, you can only rely on these three different flavors that we have out of the box, and you cannot create uh, your own custom card views. Uh, at least, uh, I would like to say, so far, hopefully in the future, someone will make the choice to make it possible. But right now, that's what we have. So uh, uh, that's what we can talk about. So uh, what do I mean? Well, when I create um, a new uh, SharePoint framework solution in order to create an adaptive card extension using the Omer generator, uh, as like as we saw a couple of weeks ago in the previous demo about the adaptive card extensions. Okay, we choose the uh, solution name, we target SharePoint Online, we can target the current folder, we can make uh, uh, the solution tenant wide available, and eventually uh, we can uh, uh, use uh, isolated permissions, and then we can choose what kind of uh, uh, component we want to create. And when we select adaptive card extension, here we see three different options. As you see, basic card, primary text, and image card. So now let me dig into each of them and let me explain you what the main uh, capabilities and features are for each of them. So first of all, let's focus on the base basic card view, which is the uh, really uh, simple one. In this scenario, you can create a card view and uh, it will be automatically created for you by the scaffolding tool, a card view, which will simply have a configurable uh, property called primary text, uh, which will be rendered uh, in the main uh, uh, as the main content of your uh, card view. And users using uh, your card view will be able, configuring the adaptive card extension, to configure just the title and the icon of the uh, adaptive card extension, which will be shown in the rendering, uh, in the default rendering of the, of the card view, uh, plus your primary text. What do I mean? Well, I have. Uh, a SharePoint uh, framework solution that I already created, where we can see this uh, um, option in action. First of all, let me use uh, the workbench uh, just to show you the actual result. And then we will see the uh, code uh, scaffolded. So let me get the basic card sample. And here you can see, this is my adaptive card extension. This is the card view. I can eventually have, and in this auto-generated one, I already have a quick view so here, when I configure my uh, adaptive card extensions, I have the capability to configure in the property pane, the title and the icon, which will be the title and the icon, which will be used for all of the 
uh, card views rendered for these uh, adaptive card extension. And then I can eventually control by code the content of the primary text, this area. And as you can see, I can configure this card as like as any other adaptive card extensions to be rendered as a medium size or as a large size. And just as a reminder, when we are in large size, we can have two uh, buttons in uh, medium size, we can have up to one uh, button rendered. So if I switch to Visual Studio Code to show you the generated code, here we have the uh, adaptive card extension, and I will not dig into the uh, implementation details of the adaptive card extension because we already covered them in the previous demo a couple of weeks ago, but I have a card view which is generated by uh, the scaffolding tool. Well, as you can see, this one inherits from base basic card view, and as you can see, we have this get data, which will return an instance of I basic card parameters interface, which only provides a primary text property, which will be the value that we see in the UI of the, uh, of the card view right here. So whenever you simply want to show a simple text message inside the card view, you should choose to use the basic card uh, layout. Keep into account that when you create an adaptive card extension, you can add as many card views and as many quick views as you like. So this one is just the auto-generated one when you go through the scaffolding tool, but that you can add additional ones simply creating your own uh, TS files and adding your own uh, card views and registering them. So this is what we have out of the box with the base basic card view. What else? Well, we can also use and have the base primary text card view, which is slightly different from the previous one. In fact, we have not only the primary text, but we also have a description that we can use to render the content of the card view. In this scenario, the user can still select an icon and a title for the uh, adaptive card extension, which will be used also to render the uh, card view. But what is uh, interesting is that we can configure two different uh, 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 sections to different uh, text areas inside the rendering uh, of the card view. Uh, again, if we go back uh, to the um, uh, workbench, I can remove this one and I can add uh, the primary one. And here we can see now we have uh, the uh, primary text and the description. The description is something that by default the user can also configure from here, but of course you can change your implementation and provide the content programmatically instead of using the UI. And again, you can play with medium and large size to render your uh, card view. Again, from an implementation point of view, let me close this one and let me dig into the primary text. The card view will simply inherit from base primary text card view. And in this scenario, the get data method will return an instance of a type implementing the I primary text card parameters, which will be at the very end, the uh, data source that you will bind to the uh, predefined rendering of your card view. In the definition of this interface, we simply have the primary text and the description. And again, here programmatically, you can render a content coming from a resource string like I'm doing right now, or you can read something from the state or from the properties of the adaptive card extension. It is up to you. The, the third and last option that we have is the one uh, that allows us to render an image card view which is the card view in editing from base image card view. And here we can uh, manage the primary text as well as the image. And this is from some degrees of perspective, in my opinion, one of the most interesting uh, card view options because we have quite some things to think uh, to keep into account. Like for example, when we provide the image, we can either provide the URL of an image or as I will show you shortly, you can also use an embedded image which will be embedded in your solution and using the required syntax, uh, you will be able to render an image embedded in your solution. You should also keep into account that when you configure the rendering of your adaptive card to be uh, with medium or large size, the behavior of the rendering of your image will change. And in fact, in the uh, medium one, the image will be rendered at the top and the size will be the one you see here, 164 by 80. And you will not have any button rendered in the UI because there is 
not enough room to render also a button in the medium one. If you will switch to the large one, you will have it 164 by 180 size, which will be rendered on the right side of the card, and you will be eventually able to have uh, some buttons rendered in the UI. And again, like always, users can configure title and icon. So let me switch back to this third option. Let me remove this item and let me add the image one just to show you the card in action. This is with the default image generated by Microsoft with the uh, Human Generator for SharePoint framework. And as you can see, if I will switch from medium to large, the image will move to the right side of the um, of the rendering of my card. Plus, if we go to the uh, actual implementation of this card view, and I'm almost done now, we have the basic type, which is base image card view. The interface will provide the primary text and the image URL, which can actually be the URL of an image or can be based on the required syntax using uh, an asset, which can be embedded in my solution. And I can eventually return through the card buttons method one or two buttons, which will be available if and only if I will use the larger uh, view. In fact, if I come back here and I refresh this view, we can see that now we have the SharePoint logo, which is taking the whole right area of the screen. I see the two buttons, but if I will switch to the medium size, I will simply see the picture at the top, the image at the top, and the primary text. However, if you want to trigger, for example, a quick view or something else, you can still implement the action right here, the on-card selection. And instead of using an external link action, you can always use a quick view action and still trigger uh, or render a quick view when you do that. So at the very end, three different uh, flavors to render card views based on a predefined rendering provided by Microsoft. And depending on the rendering that you want to use, you will have different options to configure to to make your uh, adaptive card extension render in the best way. And that's all for me as well. So back to you, David. Awesome, Paolo. Thank you so, so much. That's a great overview uh, for such a new technology in the community. Many, many are, uh, are just coming up to speed and that's going to be super valuable. Well, thank you again to all of our presenters today, Ejaz, Hugo, and Paolo. Excellent job. Let's take a look at our recording opportunities. You can see this within 24 hours at the Microsoft 365 community YouTube channel, aka.ms forward slash m365pnp slash videos. Always follow us on Twitter for the latest updates at Microsoft 365 Dev or at Microsoft 365 PNP or both. The next Viva Connections and SPFX call is going to be two weeks from today. Same bat time, same bat channel, January 13th, 7 a.m. Pacific time. Adjust that for your time zone. And then the next M365 General Dev call will be next week at this exact same time. You can always get the invites at aka.ms forward slash m365pnp. In addition to those calls, we have additional community calls, M365 platform. That's the one that's given by Microsoft. There's always going to be Microsoft uh, employees doing those demos. So great, great opportunity. Uh, that's going to be on Tuesdays, as well as the adaptive cards, Microsoft identity platform, office add-ins, and power apps community calls. And then, of course, the two that we just reviewed, the Microsoft 365 dev sig, which uh, is going to be next week, and the SharePoint framework sig, which you're in right now. Get access to all of these at aka.m s forward slash m365 pnp thank you to everyone for joining today and being so communicative and collaborative in the uh, chat and again thank you to our presenters so so much have a great long weekend everybody